Edo Arctic 2, Polar Research for Education, innovative program in Poland and Norway. Webinars. I am a specialist and at Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. I work in a science communication unit. And today let's talk about a little bit about Siberia. Uh, it is uh, the new educational toolkit in our project at Arctic 2. So uh, after our classes, I will tell you where you can find the, the, that toolkit and the, the other ones uh, concerning many interesting issues. So the first one, uh, let's talk about the geography a little bit. Uh, I think that uh, the most uh, important information you will find in the video, so I will show it to you. Uh, unfortunately, it would be a little bit <laughs> time consuming because we tested uh, the technical um, possibilities to show it easier, but uh, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, but uh, we do it that way. Uh, it is a very big uh, geographical region, belongs to Russian Federation, and um, it has uh, also not the borders only with the states around, but also the natural, let's say, borders where, where there are uh, the mountains range or the ocean. So, Let's listen a little bit about this. Sorry, some ads. So what on here counts as Siberia? Well, it's fuzzy, not just its bears, its borders. Today's lines on maps tell me this vast area is in Russia, north of Kazakhstan, Mongolia, and China. Along the edges are also Korea, Japan, and Alaska. The Ural Mountains draw a line at the western edge of Siberia. All the rest is bounded by ocean. Which ocean? Well, the one to the east, and the other one to the north. But not all Siberia's water is salty. For many peoples of Siberia, life is lived along a river, including the Ob... Okay, uh, we will talk about the hydrosphere of the Siberia later, later on. And now I have a question for you. There is a short map uh, about uh, Siberia. And the on the upper left side, you can see marked in a red color the area of Siberia, uh, because it's the region, as you can see, in the central part of Russian Federation. Sometimes, in historical uh, meaning, um, the um, far east belonged to Siberia, but. Uh, yeah, in geographical meaning, uh, that uh, part in red in mark, a uh, mark in red color, it's the proper name of uh, Siberia region. So um, I know that uh, the Pacific Ocean and Arctic Ocean is quite easy, but please tell me using chat, where are the China? You have the numbers on a map, so that would be easier, I hope. Who knows? Or maybe Ural Mountains. That might be easier. Oh yes, five is China. Great, thank you so much. Okay, and how about the Ural Mountains? Oh yeah, yes, that's number two. Thank you so much. Uh, the rest one uh, we want to do uh, want to do it. Uh, the activity you will find in the educational toolkit. Of course, it is interactive one, so that would be far more interesting. Okay, so uh, how about the population of the Siberia? So it is estimated that, um, and there are twenty five and six million people uh, in Siberia. And it is uh, almost 80% of the total population of Russian Federation. I would like to emphasize uh, the role of the 
indigenous people of Siberia, because uh, very often when we are talking about the Russian Federation and the Siberia, uh, we thought we are thinking about the Russian language, Russian culture, and so on. But it is a very big region where there are a lot of nationalities, ethnic groups, and of course, languages. Oh, yeah, we have a participant from Siberia. Wow, that's great. That's great. I've never been to Siberia, but I'm a fluent uh, speaking Russian speaker. So I, I can uh, I can communicate in Russian. That's my one of my favorite languages. Unfortunately, I don't speak any of the Siberian languages because there are a lot of them. <laughs> oh, that's very nice. Uh, from what part of Siberia uh, are you? Wow, Vinian. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we will talk a little about uh, a, a little bit about the uh, Tuvinian um, so uh, throat singing today. <laughs> I'm very impressed uh, by that type of uh, singing. Wow, maybe I will have a chance in my life to hear it live. <laughs> very nice to meet you. I'm very glad that you are here with us. Thank you. Okay, uh, so there is also a video and I will, yeah, there is, uh, the video is available in the toolkit. Uh, in a very short, um, uh, you can see the information about the indigenous people, the, the groups, the ethnic groups, the, the languages. Uh, I'm a philologist and I'm a big fan of the foreign languages. So for me, it's very interesting that uh, here in that part of the world we have so many cultures so many uh, so many languages yes um so there is not only the russian language of course which is uh, the main language for communication but it doesn't mean that every person in uh, siberia speaks uh, fluently russian okay um we have a few ethnic groups i was uh, talking about uh, and I was talking about and um, as you can see um, there is also some languages that I that are dying off or unfortunately dead languages um, it is connected uh, for example with the history because when uh, Siberia um, was became a part of the Russian Federation and the uh, Russian Kingdom before um, it lost uh, its identity let's say because the Russian culture and the Russian language was uh, forcing to to use in that that region. So that's why not so many people uh, were able uh, to cultivate their um, their habits, their culture, and unfortunately, many of the ethnic groups disappeared in the last decades. So that's why uh, we are losing the the languages, um, very unique ones in Siberia. It is the, the issue not only connected with Siberia, uh, that the issue of disappearing languages, uh, it is common, for example, in um, Southern America, Africa, for example, because there are many, many languages. And if, our, if there are no speakers, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a big pity that we are losing them. Um, but it is also the issue that uh, that, that is uh, connected with with the situation language situation in Siberia. How about the climate? Uh, because when we are talking about the Siberia, the first uh, thought that came to our mind is, "Wow, that might be minus sixty and so on." Of course, during winters there is uh, there are uh, such kind of temperatures. <laughs> I uh, I am also a Russian teacher, and uh, I remembered one of my classes. We were watching the movie from Novosibirsk. Oh yeah, that, that is the that that place in the, in the map. Oh, thank you, Tatiana. And uh, we were discussing the, the that movie, and there was very nice movie movie with the student who communicated with uh, her her granny and she 
she asked granny what is the temperature like in your in your city uh, uh, that was minus 10 or something and uh, or minus 20 and it was like oh my god it's so warm yeah and <laughs> we were laughing uh, uh, because yeah minus 20 it's it's uh, yeah quite a huge number but minus 60 minus 50 it's uh, much more and there is a short experiment that was uh, shown in social media by uh, um, by Oleg uh, who lives in Novosibirsk and with the frozen food as you can see there is an egg and there is the pasta uh, and the temperature of minus 45 degrees it looks like this uh, and Oh yeah, yes, Yakutia is uh, also the region with very, very low temperatures. And uh, Tatiana, you wrote about the um, your your roots. Uh, that's very interesting. I a few years ago I encountered a very nice international, uh, but with Russian origin project. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work anymore because I, I checked it before our classes and it was like um, something like um, something connected with uh, with the roots of the people living in Siberia. You uh, were able to communicate with that uh, center. Uh, they took some blood samples and they have very uh, big database with uh, the information about the roots of many people from different regions in uh, in, in uh, Siberia. So, for example, you were able to check what uh, were your ancestors from what uh, region probably you, your parents your family came from so yeah that was very nice and yeah yeah but unfortunately it was only in russian not in in english and yeah it uh, it doesn't exist anymore that project but i believe that there are many uh, such kind of programs <laughs> thank you so much thank you okay and how about the temperatures uh, i also have a short video about this uh, because it's not only means that in siberia there are uh, i don't know all, only low temperatures during winter because in the summertime uh, the temperatures um, are enough for for example plants to to grow to, for people to live and a uh, very Im important fact is that in, in Siberia there is a lot of geographical variety. Uh, we have uh, many uh, plant uh, zones uh, in the region of Siberia. Okay, so let's look a little bit close to the topic of the temperatures Okay. So they are talking about the history. Oh. Hmm. We have a problem with Cisco, so <laughs> I'm not sure if you're able to see me. Um I believe not.
I hope that you uh, watch uh, part of the video concerning the temperatures. So the author of the, the film told us that, uh, of course, in winter we have very strong uh, and low temperatures, but uh, during the summer it's uh, plus uh, 20, plus uh, 30 or even more. So it doesn't mean that uh, there is only very cold there. And uh, there was an information about some biomes that we can observe uh, on Siberia area. And uh, I will discuss it later on to show you some photos and some um, basic information about this. So about the Novosibirsk, uh, it is a city uh, that is located in the, in the south of Siberia. And uh, please look uh, very close to, to the uh, names of the cities because, as you can see, those cities are quite big. And uh, later on, we will explain why exactly those cities are located in the south. Okay. Yes, the end the hydrosphere. Uh, there is also an information uh, when we are talking about uh, geographical issues about main rivers that uh, are uh, in the Siberia territory. So we have Ob, Yenisei, Lena, Amur, and Kolyma. Uh, as you can see, the Lena is the longest uh, river. Uh, it is more than four thousand kilometers and interesting thing um, because I worked uh, one year on Spitsbergen Island uh, in Polish Polar Station Hornsund and we for example can observe uh, and not only us uh, the previous expeditions the people who, who worked who, who work who live uh, on the Spitsbergen uh, the some parts um, the wood that is uh, being transported via seas and ocean, and uh, those pieces um, reach, uh, for example, the shore of ice uh, of the Spitsbergen. So, where does the wood come from? From Siberia, from the biggest uh, rivers like Alp, like Lenisei, because they are used uh, for transportation of of the wood, um, and that's why sometimes some of that. Um, some of the material um, escape, let's say, uh, in, in, and uh, is able to traveling uh, thanks to the ocean currents to many different parts of the world. So that's why uh, on Spitsbergen we don't have trees, but we have wood from Siberia, thanks to the ocean currents. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the additional information. Uh, maybe not, uh, I, I'm not sure if all our participants of today's meeting know, but we have one participant from Siberia. And uh, Tatiana is uh, writing very interesting information concerning our today's topic. Uh, thank you, thank you, Tatiana, for it. Um, another interesting fact uh, connected with Siberia is something uh, we can call Zimnik in Russian. Uh, it's like ice road uh, in English. Uh, in Poland, uh, we don't have something like this because the winters are not so strong. Uh, and it is um, kind of road made on, of course, temporary road. Uh, it is uh, made on frozen river, for example, because there is no other ways um, or not no of other word roads to to use, for example. So we have, for example, su such kind of ice road uh, made on um, made on Amur, uh, one of the rivers we mentioned before. On Baikal Lake, it is also very popular to travel across the frozen Baikal Lake. It's nothing strange for the uh, for the local people, for us. Uh, for the Poles, for example, it is uh, exotic, uh, but of course uh, that situation were observed in the history, the past, where, for example, in Poland also the winters were strong because it's natural when we don't have a, a road, we um, on ice, on the, the snow, can make um, the path 
for for the transportation of course the very important thing is to think about the uh, the security so uh, yeah sometimes in uh, uh, runet it is uh, russian internet you can uh, see some videos uh how people uh, in Siberia, for example, use zimniks uh, to travel across. It's it's very interesting. Okay, uh, I hope that you you have the link, but I will send it uh, once again because I had technical problems with with Cisco. Uh, so it is uh, interactive material, and when you click on it, you can see some uh, points. Uh, four of them, of course, it doesn't mean that there is all only four of them, uh, but uh, I, mm, I choose uh, four, let's say, uh, points that many of them of you uh, maybe know. So uh, there is a short description if you if you click on that uh, red dots on the on the on the image. So it is something uh, that covers us the topic of the, the, the geology and interesting thing connected with uh, the Siberia is the permafrost because we were talking a lot, a lot about the global warming and uh, the temperatures in the Arctic that they are uh, growing up, that uh, the permafrost is melting, the animals are affected by some global changes in climate and so on. But the Siberia is the region where we can observe the those changes in real time, let's say, because uh, the permafrost is the typical, uh, of course, not for all the parts of Siberia, but in for many regions of, say, of Siberia, typical phenomenon, and it is melting very rapidly. Uh, there is a uh, short um, information how it looks like the permafrost is uh, permanently frozen ground um, beneath uh, the so-called active layer and uh, permafrost means that the frozen ground doesn't melt but unfortunately we we can observe such kinds of situation and it may cause many let's say side effects for the humanity because it's not, not only the changes in the landscape. Of course, the, those changes are uncomfortable for people who live in the region uh, of uh, permafrost. Because, for example, there are um, they have roads and other inter infrastructure that is destroyed by those uh, landscape changes. Um, Huh. No, <laughs> maybe I I won't uh, show you the video because I I'm afraid of of the Cisco. I would like to uh, emphasize other video materials, but there is uh, in the toolkit. I will later on this uh, tell you a little bit more about this. Mm, there is a link to the very nice um, news concerning the melting permafrost and how it affects the local people because uh, that influence is is quite huge we have for example many forms of landscape that uh, that are typical for um for siberia for example it is called pingo and palsa uh, it is connected with the process of towing permafrost of melting permafrost and uh, the result of it is, for example, some small mounds, uh, small uh, around uh, on the area where there was permafrost, and it is complicated for people who live there, who, for example, has suddenly a lake near their, their house, and when the the house was built, there was there was there was there was no lake, so yeah. It's a little bit complicated. Okay, and uh, yes, it is uh, the part of the the video, the the one of the scene. As you can see, there is a village, and uh, during the springtime, it looks like this. There is a problem of the roads because they are bumpy because of the changes in permafrost structure, and the houses might be even destroyed by the movements of the surface because of the process of uh, melting, towing 
permafrost. Uh, okay, yes, yes, yes. I will send all you all the, the, the links uh, that was mentioned during the presentation, so don't worry. Yeah, I know that it is uh, complicated to uh, watch all of it, but uh, if you are curious, uh, I'm, with, I'm very glad uh, that you want to see it after our classes. Uh, this, I, the plants of Siberia, of course, it is a very short overview because Siberia is a very vast and big region and uh, there is a lot of inform interesting information about this. Mm, in the video you we, we watched, uh, there was an information that the agriculture is possible with, of course, some without uh, natural uh, without artificial activity of the like irrigation, it's possible between 50 and 60 degrees. Uh, yes, that's true, because as you can see, the climate is uh, friendly enough for the plants to grow in that area. Uh, in the north, we have Arctic desert, we have tundra, and uh, in the south, the temperatures during the summers are very high, so the irrigation uh, system is necessary uh, somehow to, to to grow anything there. Um, so uh, it is um, the first thing, and the second thing is the are the biomes. Uh, the biomes were were mentioned in the video before. So I just uh, go through very quickly through the topic. The biome is a term that describes uh, the plants typical for the climatic zone. So, for example, like tundra. Tundra is very, very nice example. Uh, we have a project, Adarctic Project 2, that is focusing the Arctic area. So, we talk a, a lot about tundra. Uh, so, as you can see, as you can, as, as you know, the tundra is a biome without trees, shrubs. We have only small grasses, lichens, mosses. So, yes, uh, it's a biome. And uh, on Siberia territory, we have a few biomes because uh, that is very big territory. Um, so, we have even Arctic deserts. So, the places with no almost uh, plants uh, where there is a very harsh climate, uh, Arctic climate. We have tundra. Uh, I uh, tell you a little bit a little bit about tundra before. So um, the growing season is in tundra is uh, very short. During the Arctic uh, summer it's uh, 50 and, or between 50 and 60 days. So yes, it's very short. And we have the phenomenon of midnight sun and polar night. So it also affects uh, the plant, um, the plants that are growing in that area. We have forest tundra. It's some kind of transition zone because between the tundra and the forest. So as you can see, uh, it is uh, more or less the landscape typical for tundra, but we have trees. So it is uh, the third biome. The fourth biome is taiga uh, or boreal forest, and it is the main uh, and more the most characteristic for all the Siberia. So when we are talking about the Siberia, taiga is first that comes to our mind. But not only. We are, we are aware of other biomes we can observe in Siberia. And the, sec the last one is the forest steppe in the south. Uh, it is an another uh, transition zone uh, between uh, the, uh, the taiga with the, the high trees and the steppe. The animals of Siberia. Uh, short overview. As you can see, there are many species from different uh, climatic zone, different from different biomes. Reindeer, for example, or polar fox are typical for tundra. Brown bear, uh, Siber Siberian taiga for the taiga. So uh, there is a big variety of uh, wildlife in Siberia. And uh, uh, recently I uh, read very nice um, very nice um, book about Siberia, uh, written by a Polish um, uh, geographer, 
very nice one and um, he described uh, the special trainings and courses that are organized in schools at universities for for uh, children for students uh, how to survive in taiga uh, because uh, taiga is everywhere it, villages uh, are surrounded by it so people uh, should have the knowledge how to behave in such kind of a natural environment and how to survive when for example they are they go uh, for a trip and they are lost the same is for tourists uh, that the, the writer as a tourist also participated in that training he has a lot of friends siberian friends who helped him but uh, when we are planning to go to taiga and we uh, don't have a uh, experience uh, we need to uh, obtain the knowledge how to what how to be well prepared for it it's not like uh, for example here in poland the forest we are going to for a trip but it is uh, more dangerous uh, the plants uh, the animals so yes it's uh, one of the most uh, wild region uh, natural region in the world so yes that's beautiful uh, it, and it's very nice that uh, still we have such kind of areas on our planet. We were talking about towing permafrost and some threats for humans. That's I said that it's of course of course global warming, uh, the changing in lines, changes in landscape, but uh, the other phenomenon, uh, not positive one not positive one um, typical for siberia is uh, the the rapid um, the the release uh, of for example uh, some gases uh, like methane uh, that uh, cause the greenhouse effect and when the permafrost is towing we can find interesting artifacts inside its structure so it means that uh, we can uh, the scientists or the local people can find uh, animals who that uh, lived many many years ago it's interesting because uh, the scientists can do the research observe the wildlife uh, that was before the era of of humanity but unfortunately there are many bacteria, microorganisms trapped in the permafrost. So when it's melting, those uh, bacteria are released into the atmosphere. And we prepare an article on our website about uh, what lurks in glaciers and oh, <laughs> and <laughs> and permafrost. Uh, so yes, there is an information. For example, about the numbers of the bacteria that might be found in the frozen ground. So um, that might be dangerous for the people who live uh, in Siberia, for the animals uh, that, uh, of, the, of that people, uh, because the bact bacteria and viruses are unknown, some of them, and they may cause diseases. Uh, a few years ago, there was a situation uh, when big uh, numbers of reindeers uh, died because of the virus and uh, it is a very important uh, issue for the people who are the reindeer herders and it is also typical for Siberia because it's uh, one of the uh, points of the traditional uh, Siberian um, lifestyle let's say yeah Yes, yes, yes. The taiga. Uh, yeah, I was so surprised when I read the book about the taiga and uh, how the small kids uh, are able to to behave in such kind of environment. That was for me like you know the the small kid uh, has such kind of abilities and skills that I only can dream up about. <laughs> yes. Okay, so maybe I will try to show you a, just a sh small part of the movie because I think it's worth seeing the, the, the small horse that was found in the permafrost, towing perma permafrost structure. Thank you. 
This discovery is the first of its kind, with a perfectly preserved three-month horse of a now extinct species in the Siberian permafrost. The remains of a now extinct species of horse have been unearthed in the Siberian permafrost. Semyon Grigoryev, the head of the Mammoth Museum in Yakutsk, told the Siberian Times that this discovery is unlike any other. This horse was said to have been completely preserved by permafrost and was found buried 30 meters underground in the Batagi Depression in the Yakutia region of Siberia, according to the Siberian Times. The foal was discovered by a team of scientists from Northeastern Federal and Kindai Universities in Japan while on an expedition to the Virjoyansky district of Yakutia. The horse was just three months old when it died during the late Paleolithic period, approximately 40,000 years ago. According to Grigoryev, this is the first find in the world of a prehistoric horse of such a young age and with such an amazing level of preservation. Okay, so the horse was only four years old. As we can hear. Yes, yes, it's work. It works. Yes, I'm still here. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yes. So yeah, I will show. I will send you the link to the to the material. It's very nice and interesting. Yes. So it is a very old horse. Yes, he was uh, <laughs> four years old, but for us, it's very old. The economy. Uh, yes, uh, we were talked about the Novosibirsk that is located in the southern part of Siberia, and uh, I. Uh, ask you about uh, why the big cities are, are, are located uh, what uh, are located in that part of of the territory because uh, it uh, because of the trans siberian railway that was built in the 19th century and the, the the works were finished in the very beginning of the uh, 20th century. As you can see the, the dates, uh, it is a very big uh, railway line, biggest one in the in the world. Uh, yes, that, Tatiana, that would be very nice. If you can send us uh, the link, I think that would be very, very interested. interesting. Um, for all of us. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, in Poland, um, yeah, the Russian uh, kinematography is not so popular, but uh, sometimes uh, in the, well, now everything is closed, but <laughs> we have very nice uh, a film festival, a Sputnik, that is organized in Poland, and uh, there is a, a nice possibility to see a lot of uh, films from um, Russian Federation territory. So, uh, in December, there was another edition of Sputnik, and uh, yes, even from Siberia, there are some movies. Uh, so, during the film festivals in Poland, there is a possibility to see uh, the movies, not all of them, unfortunately, but still it's a possibility. So if you if you uh, can send us uh, the link, share it uh, with us, I will I will appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yes, and uh, it is uh, when we are talking about the Trans Siberian Railway, it is it has very important uh, economic uh, meaning uh, for the old Siberia and. Um, it is not only for the communication, it is also for transporting uh, some mineral deposits that, uh, um, of, uh, that are uh, located in many parts of Siberia. And that's why Siberia is very important in economical meaning and political meaning for the whole Russian Federation. Uh, we have here the same map and uh, there are marks uh, with the numbers of some um, economical uh, districts, economical places of main importance in Russian uh, Federation in Siberia. So we have, uh, for example, the Ural Economic Region, Kuznetsk uh, Industrial District, and uh, some city centers important uh, 
from the economical view of uh, point of view, like Norilsk, Smirny, and Magnitogorsk. Um, it's very strange because I speak Russian and <laughs> and uh, saying it without the Russian pronunciation sounds strange for me. Uh, yeah, and uh, also there are some constructions like uh, hydroelectric power plants or on some uh, Siberian rivers. So yes, uh, it is only the my, um, very small part uh, of the of the topic of economy of Siberia, uh, you can uh, find a lot of uh, information on YouTube uh, concerning that issue. Unfortunately, uh, many of them are in Russian. So, for example, for Polish speakers, that might be a little bit problematic, but sometimes with Russian subtitles. Um, other interesting uh, rail railway, um, it which is um, very sometimes uh, Com compared with the Trans-Siberian Railway, it's a Baikal Amur mainline, BAM. It's it's called for short, uh, but it um, it has different meanings. Uh, meaning it is far more shorter than uh, Trans-Siberian Railway, and it is nowadays used mainly for the communication and need some parts of the mainline uh, need. Uh, Modern, modernization, let's say. Um, they um, used to play a big and important role uh, in the 20th century, where uh, it has the role of the transportation of some mineral deposits. And nowadays it is used for the transportation, but yes, it's uh, in uh, not in a such good shape like the trans civilian Railway, and there was also some problems with uh, finishing the the, bill, the the investment because it was completed only in the very beginning of on, of twenty uh, first century in two thousand and three. Oh yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, I think that I heard about that film. I'm not so sure, but some of my colleagues told me about this. Oh yeah, so just give me a second. I will copy the information from the chat because when we are, when we finish uh, the classes, uh, that would be gone. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, uh, and we have, uh, those uh, um, those roads, railway roads, uh, um, marked on the map. Uh, in red line, we have Trans-Siberian Railway, as we can see, as uh, is quite huge, and uh, Baikal Amur Main Line in green color, and um, also um, other uh, region that has a very important role in economical meaning is uh, Yamal Peninsula, for example, where, where there are a very big uh, gas deposits located. So also it is, um, it plays strategic role for all the economy of Russian Federation. The culture, and that would be uh, the last part of our presentation. I go through it uh, shortly. So uh, I told you a little bit, a little about a little bit about the the languages uh, that are on Siberia. Now we have approximately forty languages uh, on Siberia that belong to eleven uh, language families. Uh, as I said, some of the uh, languages unfortunately died. Uh, data out um, because there are not anymore the speakers uh, of that languages, the users. Some of them, if they are exist, um, use Russian uh, language instead. Shamanism is kind of a religious uh, practice that we kind of we, ha we can observe we can observe on Siberia region. It is. Uh, very, it, and it plays a very important role uh, in the culture of indigenous people. 
Mm, I unfortunately I haven't been yet to Siberia, uh, but uh, my uh, friends who were there they were amazed by the meetings uh, with shamans because it's possible to to meet real shaman in Siberia. The other thing is the throat singing. Uh, we have a, a participant from Tuva today, so uh, I'm very glad that uh, we have a slide connected with a small part of Tuvinian culture. So it is the throat singing. Uh, the throat singing is a method not only typical for Siberia, for example, for Inuits on Greenland, uh, for Sami in the um, Sami Republic in the northern uh, part of the Norway. So, so it is a very important part of the culture. And as you can see, it's very hard to present. For me, it's something that I can't imagine. So let's uh, hear a small sample of the Tuvinian uh, throat singing. Hey everybody, it's Tony Robbins. Listen, oh I'm God. reaching out to you right this? now because oh, yeah. I'm mad. I'll do it too. I'm so. Amazing, huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, stop sharing. Yes, I'm still there. Yes, and uh, the, mm, it is connected with singing in the same time in two or even three tones. So the practice of such kind of uh, singing, I think, may took you some <laughs> some time. The lifestyle. Uh, Okay, thank you. Ah, thank you. Thank you for the information. You are the, our expert today of, uh, of uh, Siberian culture. Thank you so much, uh, Tatiana. Uh, Chum and Yaranga are the examples of traditional uh, dwelling made by uh, some ethnic groups living in Siberia. As you can see, um, they are different in shape, but the function is the same. Uh, they are they might be transported on sledges, for example, in many distances, and mainly they are they are used by uh, people who uh, has a nomadic type of lifestyle, and they are moving across uh, across the Siberia, across some uh, some territories with their families and with their herds. Uh, the Nenets, uh, one of the ethnic group uh, that live uh, in Siberia, um, are the reindeer herders. And the herding, the reindeer husbandry, is also the part of lifestyle of some nomadic uh, traditional Siberian uh, groups. And also has an economical meaning because uh, thanks to the uh, husbandry, reindeer husbandry, they uh, are able to support uh, their families and uh, um, live um, uh, thanks to the, the, the animals. Uh, I think that uh, we are going <laughs> uh, to the, the end of the, the presentation and it is high time to eat the second breakfast, so the cuisine would be perfect here. Uh, some kinds of um, 
some par uh, some examples of uh, traditional cuisine. Uh, we have dalgan and we have buzy. Buzy is are similar to Polish pierogi. Um, I don't know Italian ravioli, uh, pilmieni, for example, because the the recipe is very simple. We have a dough and we have something inside the the meat, for example, uh, the meat, and it is boiled. But the shape is different, uh, and uh, traditionally it um, looks like a, a, a looks like a yurt. Yurt, it's uh, also uh, another type of. Uh, house traditional house uh, in siberia in Mongol or in mongolia as well yes um so it's it has the shape of yurt and uh, we have dalgan from tuvan cuisine um i think that uh, tatiana uh, can tell us more about that dish very traditional one i uh, i found an information that it is um, first very simple to prepare and um, uh, second, um, very tasty uh, because it's fat, it's a fatty food. So if you eat dalgan, you have a lot of energy for the big part of your of the day. So, uh, so yeah, maybe uh, I think that uh, uh, in, for example, at uh, at my home I can prepare dalgan, but I need to look for the special type of uh, of the flow to to prepare it to make it. Okay, wow, sorry, I I thought that uh, 30 minutes would be enough for the lesson, but it's, believe me, the last slide of the presentation. And it is the information about the educational toolkit covers uh, the topic, big topic of Siberia. Uh, maybe I will uh, hmm, send you the link to the, to the toolkit. I do it before, but uh, I had technical problems and there is a lot of activities connected with the Siberia, uh, some additional information and materials that uh, weren't used uh, during the, the classes. Uh, you can do it on your own with your students uh, during classes as you, as you wish. And now the toolkit is available in English but I'm working on the Polish version. So I hope that maybe in a two weeks perspective, that would be available on also in uh, Polish. I'm talking about this because I, I can see that we have some participants from Polish, uh, from Poland. Okay. Yes, uh, the very, very last slide. If you will have any question, just uh, you can ask me, you can ask Tatiana. Um, wow, it's very nice that we have a participant from the Siberia. Here is my email address. If you would like to contact me, please do it. Watch other recordings from webinars on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash edoarctic. EduArctic 2, from polar research to scientific passion, innovative nature education in Poland and Norway receives a grant of 240,000 euros received from Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway under EEA funds.